the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the eighth chapter. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. We continue in the confession of faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Beloved, we continue with our final installment on our theme of generosity based on the four-week devotional by Gordon McDonald. Our text this week will be taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning at verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, page 1802 in the New Testament, if you desire to follow along. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but what I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. This is our text for meditation. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May his love and the comfort of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Swoosh. As I relaxed in my lawn chair, my six-year-old sank yet another basket. Watching his skill develop, I couldn't help but dream about him becoming an NBA star someday. I could just picture it. I, his proud father, in the stands adorned in the appropriate team sweatshirt after the game, a big hug for his mother and a huge kiss while fans surrounded him and screamed, we're number one. And of course, I could clearly see the big house he'd buy my wife and I in our old age. Come on, a man can dream, can't he? When my wife and I recognized his passion for basketball, for sports, everything we could do to nurture his interest and talent, we so desperately wanted to do. We found basketball camps, football camps, soccer camps in the area that would teach him the proper way to shoot, the proper way to tackle, the proper way to handle the sport. We spent time watching games, going to games, explaining the rules and pointing out the techniques of the game. It's easy to recognize our children's gifts and get excited and involved in developing them, since it's so much fun to see the progress 
kids can make. Isn't it strange that the same optimism about developing a new skill or finding a gift doesn't always spill over to adults? Maybe our reason is that when we look at children, we see nothing but a blank slate, ready to be filled with whatever outrageous and exaggerated dreams they can think up. Anything is possible. As we get older, though, our slate is no longer clean. We have responsibilities. We have obligations to leave no room for the larger-than-life dreams. We foster the belief that if we can't have it all, it's not worth trying. If we were limited to the gifts and talents we developed as children, many of us would never discover the wonderful things in store for us. Anna Marie Mary Robertson, also known as Grandma Moses, never even picked up a paintbrush until she was in her mid-70s. The year before she died, at 101 years old, she painted 25 pictures. What a loss it would have been if she had decided she had too many things preventing her from fulfilling her dreams. Sadly, that's the way many people much younger than Grandma Moses believe. When in reality, the possibilities for them are limited only by their own self-made barriers. Our theme for today, strive for it. Strive for it. The text begins by saying, excel in everything. And so, dear friends, right from the start, what prevents us from striving for excellence in everything? Yeah, may be rhetorical, may not be. What prevents you from excelling? Can we deal with the elephant right in the room? Fear. Fear prevents us from excelling. Fear of ourselves and fear of others. What will they think of me? I don't believe enough in myself, or maybe because the slate is no longer clean, I've tried that before and we tried something new and it didn't work out, so we might as well just keep doing what we've been doing. And so the fear of life, the fear of failure prevents us from excelling, and any old thing will do long as we get by and don't rock the boat. Dear friends, what if I told you that fear is a sin? I invite you to stop by 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, a spirit of timidity, but one of boldness. We can do this. What prevents us from excelling in everything? The text goes on to say some pretty profound things. Do you have some examples in your life of people who excel? We began by talking about sports. We have coaches for just about everything. You have sports coaches, you have life coaches, you have weight loss coaches. You can find a coach to help you do just about anything. If you want to put your socks or your nylons on correctly, I'm sure you can find a coach for that as well. But the text says, excel in things like faith. Do you have a faith coach? Do you have somebody who mentors you in the faith? Somebody who you believe has gone through some very interesting times, but by God's grace, they always have a witness. They have a positive word. I don't know, maybe it's October, pink is all over the place. Have you by chance talked to a breast cancer survivor? Have you talked to their loved ones and see what kind of faith it requires to make it through such a situation? Does somebody mentor you? Paul goes on to say, who do you model your speaking after? 
Is there someone in your life who is excellent at communication? By the way, since we're in October and yes, today is Reformation Day, have you thought about how eloquent Martin Luther was in his speech? The fact that you had 95 theses that started the Reformation that allowed us to have church in any form that you desire to have church today. How do you speak? And then he says, consider great thinkers. Friends, can, can, can I pause with you for a moment? Thinking scares me. Because many people don't understand that many of life's mistakes happen by somebody saying, well, I thought. <laughs> Do you have somebody you model your thinking after? I don't know, since we're in church, have you considered Athanasius? How beautifully, how eloquently he put together the understanding of the Trinity. Thinking, my dear friends, is a learned behavior. Paul says, do we excel in everything? But then he pauses and he says, have you considered being generous? Have you considered giving? Do you have somebody you model your giving after? Your generosity. Oh, don't get stuck there, not just with your money, because I know for some of us our money is funny and our change is strange, and we may not have the opportunity to give dollars because our dollars don't make sense. But do you, dear friends, have somebody who is generous with their time, who is generous with their talents, that you always model yourself after because they strive for excellence? Dear friends, I, I, I will tell you honestly, I strive to increase in my financial giving as I watch people like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett throw money at things. And Mark Zucker, I desire that. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm being, I want to be that generous. You want to know why? Because for me personally, that communicates I got that kind of money to give. I don't get upset with NBA players and NFL players that make all of this kind of money. Because what I'm trying to figure out is how do I become the person that writes their check? Do, do we strive for excellence in every area of our lives? You do understand that mediocrity is not godly. It's not biblical. Because what we do as children of God, in this very place, if you were to stop by Exodus chapter 25, this is the place where he has desired to dwell among us and to meet us. And excellence is required. Imagine with me if God gave you his second best. He didn't do that. Oh, that's just Brian, any old thing will do. <laughs> Paul invites us to say if you struggle with comparing yourselves, because that's a little uncomfortable, because now I gotta compare myself to X, Y, and Z, and they might not measure up. He says for a moment, if that's your hang up, have you considered Jesus Christ? Have you considered comparing yourself to the sacrifice and the giving of Jesus Christ? And, and I don't want you to miss this, so let me find it and read it for you. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Hmm. Hmm. He who dies with the most toys wins. Right? They're going to pull up the U-Haul right next to the hearse and follow you to the cemetery so that you can have all the toys with you. I was in my closet this morning trying to figure out what shoes to wear. And you know what I realized? I can only wear one at a time. And there are some folks right now whose souls 
are destroyed because they don't have souls on their feet. But yet I'm going to plot and scheme how I can get another pair to match the tie that I have on to match the suit that Sugar's going to wear next week. Yeah, I think about things like that. But yet our neighbors are struggling. The text says, consider our generosity. Because hoarding and not being excellent in everything that we do so that people see you as the image of Christ. You, you, we've talked about it time and time again. For many people, once you profess being a child of God, you do realize the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you behave, the way you think, is the first Bible that people will ever read. Does it communicate the excellencies of God? Does it communicate that Jesus Christ was born, died, buried, and rose again for you and for me? Or do they meet the children of God? Do they encounter God's house with scraps, with not your best? We read in our gospel lesson today, when the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. Are you living a life that someone would want to say, I want what you have? Are you living a life that says, I want to think how that brother or sister thinks? I want to be able to speak how that brother or sister speaks. There's a gentleman named Michael Eric Dyson. I heard him at a commencement speech several years ago, just blown away. Because for a minute, I had written him off because he opened with different ways that people graduated. Some graduated cum laude, some graduated summa cum laude, some graduated thank you laude. And he said, some graduated to get away from others. You ever heard all my exes live in Texas? That's why I live in Tennessee. And, and so, you know, I was kind of like, okay, it kind of cliche is. This brother began to talk, and, and, and you can see him on all different kind of political shows. I love listening to him speak because every time he opens his mouth, I guarantee you I got to find a dictionary because it calls me higher. It takes me higher. And when people encounter the children of God, are you taking them higher. Consider the excellent gift of Jesus Christ. Left heaven, all of the majesty of heaven for you and for me. Put on the stench of flesh, of sin. I, it, it, the earth is his footstool. He said, you know what? I love him too much. I'm going to go down there and hang out for a few minutes. So that you and I may have a room in his father's house of many mansions, desiring to take us higher, desiring us to have an expectation of excellency. He didn't say so you could have a shack over in the west wing of heaven so that you could be with him in his father's house of many mansions, so that you would have an awesome eternal life. And so the question today, dear friends, is not how much you give financially, in terms of your time, in terms of your talent. The question, dear friends, today is how do you give it? Do you give it with a spirit of love? Do you give it with a spirit of grace? Do you give it with a spirit of joy? Do you give it willingly? Do you give it as a reflection of God's kingdom? Because when we do that, the close of our devotion in this final week, says then and only then are you living. Do you have life? 
when you realize that everything that you have, everything that you are, everything that you do is an extension of the kingdom of heaven. And when people encounter you, they should have a God encounter. They should meet the cross in your communication. And so, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, my prayer for us is that as individuals and as a community, we strive to excel in everything that we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen.